Yo, what is up, my homies? And as always, sorry for making something so fucking late. Fuck, uh, recently I've been very, very busy. I just had this urge to make this video, and I just- because I just really want to talk about it, you know? I will be talking about the movie that the entire anime community is babbling on about. It has captivated the world and opened doors for a lot of newcomers in the world of anime. When something like this happens, it is impossible to avoid or ignore. The latest Marvel, Kimi no Nawa. In other words, your name. I do not believe I can talk about this without spoiling it. If I were to not talk about it with spoilers included, this video would be nothing but pure shit garbage bullshit and to be deemed useless. If you haven't watched this movie yet, you better get the fuck out before I ruined everything. I'm going to spoil the entire shit. I warned you. If you don't give a fuck, just watch and enjoy my take on this film. I'm going to talk about the story, music, animation, symbolism, uh, and you guys should check that part out too. It's probably the most intriguing part in this video, I think. It really gets you thinking. Next, my opinions and overall final conclusion. Uh, caution, I might go pretty deep into this to a point where I can get pretty scientific and shit like that. Sorry, it's, it's just me. Just a point out that I would like to get across before y'all start fucking me in the ass for it. While talking about my insights on this movie, I might trigger or cringe some of you guys. I don't give a flying fuck -er. Let's get this shit started, baby! What is destiny? Do you believe in destiny? What is meant to be will always find a way. Your name is heavily spiritual and borrows a lot from Japanese culture and custom shit. A person who is spiritual will find this film a straight up masterpiece and praise it for delivering a strong wonderful message. On the other hand, people who are unspiritual or I guess atheists would find this movie mundane or just generic. For me, I'm kind of finding myself somewhere in the middle. To see the true beauty of the film, one needs to educate themselves a bit on the Shinto religion that is practiced and applied in Japan. And after all, this film is from Japan and it was intended for the Japanese audience and Shinto believers. Grab some snacks and shit like that as I tell you a story of a love that surpasses time and space. That sounds so fucking cheesy. Fucking kill me now! I'll explain everything as clearly as I can and I warn you guys this will be very long because there is just too much going on in this film that cannot be explained in 5 minutes. You better put those seatbelts on kids cause we go for a long long road trip. Woo! The film revolves around Mitsuwa Miyamizu Taki Tachibana. Mitsuwa is a female high school student who lives in a rural town nestled deep in the mountains. Her father is the mayor and isn't home that much and she lives with her little sister and grandmother. Mitsuo has an honest personality, but she doesn't like the customs of her family's Shinto shrine, nor does she like her father being too focused on his work. Yeah, fuck tradition and custom! YOLO swag! I do what I want! Quoted by Mia Mizu herself. Implied. She laments that she lives in a confined rural town and yearns for a wonderful lifestyle of living in Tokyo. On the other hand, Taki is a male high school student who lives in central Tokyo. He spends his time with his friends, works part-time at an Italian restaurant, and is interested in architecture and fine arts. Nothing much about him, and I don't believe he even has even any struggles at all. Just a complete normal kid. One day, Taki and Mitsuwa switch his bodies. Mitsuwa wakes up as Taki, while Taki wakes up as Mitsuwa. What is this mystery behind the body swapping? And this shit happens, then this and that. Mostly character development and a montage of moments how they learn to adapt to each other daily life. So, uh, I guess like a slice of life episode. Then the big kicker and the plot twist happens. Do I even fucking dare to say what the twist is? Fuck it, y'all been warned in the beginning. At this point, it's your fault for continuing on this video after this point. I'll pause for a good two seconds if some of you guys do care. You fucking ready? Is this considered deep analysis? Why not? Let's go over the history in this universe first. There's a comet called Tiamat. The comet crosses Earth every 1,200 years. My guess is that Tiamat crossed Earth about two times before the start of the film. Tiamat splits when it's in perigee. Some of it becomes meteors and evaporates. However, a piece of it becomes a meteorite and impacts the Earth's surface and because of this, it leaves a huge crater. About 1,200 years has passed. A group of ancient Japanese people inhabit the area and called the Itomori. In Japanese culture, land that are given names have symbolic meanings to it. The translation for Itomori is threaded forest. Ito is thread, mori is forest. This isn't the exact words, but based from the kanji, you can kind of make up this conjugation. From the name too, you can easily generalize that this place is engulfed by trees and are one with nature. Another quick thing you can kind of point out is just from the first few minutes of the film, people living there are experts when it comes to knitting threads. Another 1020 years has passed and Comet Tiamat makes another visit creating another crater. From this natural catastrophe, the inhabitants of Itomori saw the Comet as a god and believed that it was a judgment for not worshipping it. 
since they are aware of the first crater, they know that this is bound to happen again if they do not change their ways. So avoid this from happening in the future. The people of the village appoints people who have high aptitude of spiritual powers, pretty much a shaman. Think of, think of the Native Americans for a better picture. Thus, this brings in the Miyamizu household. The representative becomes somewhat of a divine figure for the villagers. This maiden, Miko, is set to the task of preserving the old traditions, communicating with the comet, and warning people of the impending disaster if they fail to change their ways. I think their special power is clairvoyance. So, uh, Jedi's if you want a comedic analogy. Now begins our story and enters Mitsuha Miyamizu, the main protagonist of the movie and the descendant of her ancestors. From what I've explained, the movie should be more clear and everything should start to become clear as day. From what I've just said, everything becomes quite predictable. From the synopsis, uh, we know that Mitsuha dislikes her life, duties as a descendant of the Miko, and wants to leave her home village Itomori. Shit, who wouldn't? Look how fucking uncivilized and unmodernized these fucks are. I'll be bored out of my life. I will also eventually end up killing myself. Just kidding. Not anything to that extent or degree. Anyways, as you can see, Mitsuha is tasked with keeping her bloodline tradition alive and keeping the villagers to worship Tiamat. Based from what I just explained in the history part, Mitsuha cannot leave. She's inclined to do so even though her heart desires to. She's internally bounded to Itomori because of her heredity she carries and the connection she has with Tiamat. So pretty much, as you can see where this shit is going, I can go uh, a bit deeper into her bloodline and the land of Itomori, but uh, it's not really necessary. Plus, it will be very long because there's just so much going on in this film. It's amazing that it's just just like a quarter of the movie and just a bit later you can get all this information down. As you know me, I love overanalyzing shit, even the smallest and shittiest details. I always make sure to scrape every last piece of shit, y y you know what I mean? Of course, the inevitable happens and Itomori and the residence gets wrecked again by Tiamat. The fucking god? The Kami? The story then switches over to our other main character, Taki. At this point, the plot continues to build up and keep the story moving. Just when Taki was expecting to switch places with Mitsuha, it does not happen. Taki begins to feel concerned and calls her up, but that didn't work. He then took another big step, which is visiting her personally, but upon reaching to Itomori, to a surprise, it is now a desolated wasteland that was brought upon the comet. He even discovers that the events of Tiamat destroying Itomori happened 3 years ago. And Mitsu has been gone for a while now. As in, RIP. And something weird happens. A permanentization, Taki memories about Mitsuha and the messages they shared started to erase in front of his eyes. Memories of Mitsuha began to fade quickly to a point where it becomes a false memory, or to put it in better context, a dream. Taki refused to accept reality and truly believed the things he witnessed were real. From this, it seemed Taki has grew a strong relationship with Mitsuha. At this point, you can kind of call it love. Taki then takes a giant desperate measure of journeying to a sacred shrine that he vaguely remembers thanks to some historical text. In this shrine, he discovers what the fuck was going on, and then he proceeds to drink something called the Kuchi Kami Sake, translated God's Mouth Sake. This kinda reminds me of Love Juice, uh, you, you know that, that thing that leaks out a girl's pussy? Uh, sorry, um, I'm just a fucking pervert. Fuck. Taki then coincidentally slips and falls unconscious. Probably something to do with the sake, but he did trip though. Probably just a work of Deus Ex Machina here. As he falls, he sees the comet on the ceiling of the shrine. From that, he learns that the comet Tiamat is a god. He wakes up as Mitsuha again, and on the same day, Tiamat is gonna make its impact. Thus begins Taki's plan on saving her and the town folks from complete annihilation. From this, you can already see how it ends. With the help of Taki, Mitsuha is able to save her people, which altered their fate. The story ends with an epilogue five years into the future, and Taki and Mitsuha finally meet face to face. The end. Shit, how long is this already? I'm getting too fucking into this. Which is good, I hope. I really want to get on and talk about other stuff than the story. Okay, I've been blabbing on about the story and shit like that, and I bet you're wondering, what about the body switching and the other shit? Here's when things starts not to make any sense or logic. To put into words, supernatural. It took me a while to come up with this. So since the core of the film, our main protagonists are switching bodies and we can see a slice of life thing going on. They learn from different perspectives in each other. This kind of got my head scratching when I was watching this movie. What is so special about this Taki kid? Well after thinking and cursing myself for not solving the mystery, I realized there was an easy explanation. The reason why Taki is connected to Mitsuha is because they met in the past. They met face to face 3 years prior to the start of the film in Taki's timeline. Oh shit, I'm bringing in timelines now. However, Taki does not recognize her at all. To try and wring a sense of Taki, she throws him a braided cord in the hopes of Taki remembering her. To make it more convoluted here, Mitsuha herself comes from the past, while Taki is from the future. 
The obvious explanation you can kind of come up with is why Taki is connected to Mitsuha is because the braided cord is imbued with Mitsuha's spiritual powers. Since then, Taki wore as a wristband and unconsciously, he gradually soaked in Mitsuha's power. This is why they can connect to one another. Now let's talk about this timeline shit in a western perspective. Westerners tend to apply science and logic in these type of topics. Here's my interpretation. Kakiyori, translated the underworld, or you can call it a different realm of existence. At this specific area, time and space intersect, and that is how Taki and Mitsu are able to connect. Now here's a twist here, only if you paid attention. As you can see, one thing that was missing from Taki after the Kakiyori event was the braided cord. As we all know, there can only be one thing in existence in one timeline. In this case, the braided cord. If two existed, that would have started a time paradox. Now try and follow, I might, it, might, it might sound confusing, but it's that simple. To reiterate, in order for Taki to connect with Mitsuha, he needed to be in possession of the Beta Cord. In this merged timeline, Taki only had the Beta Cord for one day. That is the day before the comet and when Mitsuha gave it to Taki three years ago on a train. As Taki returns it back to Mitsuha, the Beta Cord is no longer in his possession. As a result, Taki has no memories of Mitsuha, since he didn't possess some of Mitsuha's power. Thus, he automatically forgets about Mitsuha. Why? Because the universe resolved the paradox by itself. How about that? So I guess pretty much Taki travels to the past. That's all I gotta know. Remember, it took three years for Taki to gain Mitsuha's power. Now to look at it in a spiritual and I guess in a Japanese perspective, Kakiyori is the hidden realm, a realm not known to human. It was mentioned as the underworld in this film. I'll keep this brief and easy. It's probably easier to understand than the scientific explanation I gave. To leave the underworld, you had to leave something precious behind. As Taki entered this area, he had nothing to offer. But Kakiyori tried to resolve this dilemma, and that is taking what is considered important to Taki. And at that time, it was a spiritual connection with Mitsuha. By returning Mitsuha her braided cord, he acknowledged that it was deemed important to him, along with his memories of her and spiritual connection between the two. In a sense, he paid God something important in value in exchange to rewrite history. Pretty base of Taki. Fuck, I'm barely teasing the butthole here. Get ready for me to plunge right in with my dick. Before that, let's uh, let, let, let's take a quick breather. Yeah, you know, let, let's put some of that, that lube on. If you feel me? Don't want to break your, uh, your rectum. Just some immature jokes, just a fuck, uh, for the fuck of it. Uh, I gotta keep this entertaining, you know? So, ex excuse me. After all that talk about the story, yeah, I, uh, I got a bit carried away. Just, uh, waiting to see my opinions on this. Some of you guys might be blown away or be confused as fuck. And first, to just get this out of the way, the visual for this film was absolutely breathtaking and very appealing to the naked eye. The colors and the aesthetics were very vibrant and vivid. Most of the time I was just memorized and just dazed by its beauty, as expected from Shinkai. He really brought Japan to life and made this world very immersive. In the visual department, this deserves a 10 out of 10, no question asked. This should not be a subjective thing, it should be more like an objective thing. Another thing that this film did was the cinematography. The camera works, scene effects were top notch. It really resonated with the mood of the scenes. I just love the lighting and the animation. Very fluid, it really creates that feel of realism. Still maybe a bit far from Studio Ghibli standards, but it can be up par with it. Sh shit, I just can't stop thinking about the sceneries in this movie. You can literally take a screenshot from anywhere in this film at any time and use as a wallpaper or frame as an art piece. I'm not even joking. The music on the other hand, well to be honest it wasn't that good, but it wasn't that bad either. I just I just wasn't feeling it, you feel me? I didn't like the melody at all mostly. I don't know if it's just me, but the music was really really generic. Just something that really didn't stand out for me. The soundtrack was just pure mediocrity. There was not even one single track or song that I liked in this film. Definitely not memorable. Still, some of the music did fit the scenes I guess, so uh, music is a uh, 5 out of 10 for me. I can go further into analyzing playing of the scenes, but my time is very limited here. If you have some questions, uh, leave in the comment section below. I'll be glad to answer your questions or solve your confusion, if you have any. This film has plenty of symbolism in it. I will list a few of them because they are the most important ones and the driving force for the theme of the movie. I mentioned some of these in the summary too, in case some of you guys uh, weren't paying attention. So let's see, we got the comment, old customs, the red braided cord connection to the word Musubi, Kataware Doki, relationship between our main protagonist, and I guess, dreams. Now let's look at Itomori's custom. In Shinto, the act of worshipping is very important for keeping the tradition and gods alive. 
In accordance to this, shrines and festivals are held to commemorate them. Let's think of other festivals that share the same purpose. The one that everyone knows about, Dios de los Muertos. A day that memorialized the dead so they will always be remembered and never forgotten. Memories are very important to the well-beings of a person. If one is forgotten, they are ceased to exist. Another great symbolism that kind of took me a while to come up with. Let's talk about the comment a bit. This is the driving force for the movie. Shinkai loves putting subliminal messages into his works. Comments can symbolize both good and evil. It can disrupt the order and regularity of the world. Comments are always associated with auspicious and inauspicious events. Because of this, superstition is correlated to them. Their appearance can generate as a bad omen, but for some, it can mean a new. Astrologically speaking, comments can exert positive or negative influence to people or the world. Now jumping back onto this, a comet is beautiful and radiant. Even if it's gorgeous, its true nature is chaos and despair. Now let's uh, jump ships and relate this to love. Love can be beautiful, but during certain times it can cause destruction far beyond any power. Love is a power that mankind possesses. It is a force that God himself cannot comprehend or experience. And if you connect this to the movie, the full comet represents closeness. But once it splits, it means separation and a severed link. In other words, star-crossed lovers. As the comet splits, so did Mitsuo's connection to Taki, a relationship that was not meant to be. Knowing Shinkai, he would totally do something like this. This goes back to the saying that keeps appearing in the film, and that is Katawade Doki. A very nice connection to the comment if you're able to catch it. I would love to dig deeper, but I got no time, sorry. Now right, time to think more scientific and fictionally. If you think, and I guess critically, the concepts of multiverses that work here. Scientifically speaking, Everett Universe. It is believed that we live in a multiverse where timelines are constantly changing and creating separate worlds and we each experience countless of different outcomes in each of these worlds. For instance, being dead and alive is objectively impossible, but it does exist in another universe or timeline. All of us are in the different branches of the universe that are equally real but cannot intersect with one another. Coming back to Shinto, spirits are a part of nature so in a sense spirits are everywhere in the world. Our souls can be seen as spirits, in this case Mitsuha, her soul has been traveling around the boundaries of the dead and the living through Taki, and transporting her subconsciousness to him. I feel like I'm losing some of you guys here, uh, don't think too much into it, I, it, it might hurt your brain. Next, the most important symbol that you cannot miss at all, like really you cannot miss this, the red braided cord and the word musubi. I'm gonna say the quote Mitsuo's grandma said, it is a strong message and it is important to the story. The ink thread is musubi, connecting people is musubi, the flow of time is musubi. The threads of the god arts and represent the flow of time itself. They converge and take shape. They twist, they tangle, sometimes unravel, then connect again. That's when a person consumes something, it joins the soul. That's Masubi. Uh, that was my old lady impersonation. Uh, yeah, sorry, it was shit. Uh, Masubi in the Shinto religion is considered the power of becoming or creation. Musubi also mean bonds, as in a knot or a relationship. Hmm, let's think for a bit. Does this sound vaguely similar to something? The two people connected to the red threads of destined lovers, regardless of place, time, or circumstances. This magical cord may stretch or tangle, but never break. Yup, it's definitely connections to the red string of fate. Musubi is literally the same as this shit. No questions asked. Mitsuo and Taki are separated by time, circumstances, and memories. But still, their heart are connected. The string will never break, meaning that they are meant to meet again. They are destined to be together. Finds a way. This should also kind of be like a dead giveaway too. We have seen this motif used in plenty of movies and stories throughout history. Now this brings me to Taki and Mitsuo's relationship. In the beginning of the film, they were both single and just didn't care much about finding romance at all. They welcome loneliness with open arms. However, after that supernatural event of switching places, they learn more to life and themselves and the feeling of being close to someone. As time goes on, loneliness becomes their worst enemy. You can kind of make out that their relationship kind of symbolizes finding our own perfect match. Finding that significant other is a very momental task and might seem impossible, but when that person does come along, we must make our move or else we will lose that person forever. We must have the courage to break social barriers and to face obstacles ahead and the possibilities of being rejected. Taki Sumitsuwa's courage and hard working, despite being normal, is what made them special and unique. This is also a lesson that teaches us to be more proactive and go for what our heart desires. And if you want to get more philosophical here, the relationship greatly portrays Aristotle's idea of shared virtue. Partners who challenge and inspire you to grow into your highest potential and nurture your soul. 
In this case, Mitsuha played an important role for Taki's development. He went out of his way and did the impossible. A fucking madman, I tell ya. Another symbol seen throughout Shinkai works is his usage of trains. He loves trains, and most of the time, train scenes are really symbolic. I just leave it as that. Uh, let's see if we can connect the trains in this film. I have my own, but I want to hear your own interpretation on it. Hint, there are plenty of ways to interpret this, really. The last symbolism I'm gonna go through is the body swapping. In this film, the way our protagonists switch bodies are through the concept of dreaming. Here's a nice description on this type of dream and what does it mean. To dream that you are switching lives with someone else or that you are living someone else's life implies that you need to consider something about someone else's perspective. You need to be more sympathetic to others. Alternatively, dreaming of swapping lives represents an escape from your own personal issues and stresses. You wish you were someone else. This is exactly what Mitsuo was going through. Remember, she was sick and tired of her mundane tradition life and her role as the Miko of the village. She also cried out to the gods that she wished to become a boy in her next life, and boom! God delivered and granted her wish. Well, let's just say it was also a coincidence that her spiritual powers develop in that point too. This experience also taught her a very important life lesson, and that is, to be thankful for what you got. Now to get a bit sciencey here, I took a psychology class in my university, and after watching this film, I can kind of make a direct connection to the dreams Mitsuo are having. The meaning of dreams varies across different cultures and period of time. By the late 19th century, German psychiatrist Sigmund Freud has become convinced that dreams represent an opportunity to gain access to the unconscious. By analyzing dreams, Freud thought people can increase self-awareness and gain valuable insights to help them deal with the problems they face in their lives. Freud made a distinction between the manifest content and the latent content of dreams. Manifest content is the actual content or a storyline of a dream. Latent content, on the other hand, refers to the hidden meaning of a dream. I'll leave you to find the connection for those. Nice to get your brain working and thinking instead of me explaining it. Interpret it yourself. It's quite fun to put the puzzle pieces together. Plus, if I do explain it, I'll end up sounding like a professor and I might go way off topic because I know how I am. Okay, uh, where am I in terms of time? Oh fuck. I better speed this along. Here comes in my opinion and a warning. This is where I lay out my takes on the movie. I may upset or surprise some of you guys here. Let's start. Well, to be straight up honest here, I did not enjoy the movie as I thought I would have expected. I've been hearing the praise for this for almost half a year now. I was like, shit, this might be the masterpiece of all time if everyone's claiming it to be the goodest shit this generation of anime has to offer. Well, now that I've watched it, I am kind of disappointed. Probably because I walked into the movie with really high expectations. I can name at least five movies that were better in terms of story and enjoyment that I watched in the past years. If you look past the messages, emotion, and all the other stuff being conveyed, the story is pretty generic and really isn't all that fascinating and golden. Half of the time I was just thinking in my head and just thinking too critically throughout the film. There are just some small details that really bother me. If you know me, I love paying attention to close details. Another thing that ruined the experience for me was drama and the emotional parts. I felt like those were really forced and its main goal was to get a cheap tear from us, the audience, and put a dagger into our hearts. Of course, it succeeded, and almost everyone around me, or I know, were tearing up, or just bawling out their eyes. For me, I totally saw it coming, and I didn't show any sympathy during this scene. Probably I'm just a cynical asshole and a complete fucking dick. Or in better terms, I'm an artist. You know, I'm autistic. Overall, the story was started off pretty solid. I enjoyed the slow buildup, but when it reached the climax, the movie pacing just revved up. I would've enjoyed it more if it had more exposition. For instance, maybe more character development for our main protagonist. The montage shit worked out in a way, but I believe it was not enough. Our character between each other was just weak in my eyes. Like, what the fuck, right? All of a sudden, they just both fall in love with each other. I forgot if there's anything that prompted love with our characters. This was a major concern for me, and I probably would have showed some sympathy during these emotional scenes if there was more, you know, character build up. Well, judging that, they have switched bodies for, let's just say, uh, let's make a simple assumption for a good month. During that time, they probably learn from each other. And you, you know the saying, it takes one to know one? Uh, I guess it, it, it makes sense. And here is something that I just want to say. Uh, what Taki did was rewrite history, so doesn't that mean there's a paradox? Mitsuwa and the majority of the residents living in Itomori aren't supposed to be alive, you know? So, technically speaking, Taki is now living in a fake universe. Paradox. <laughs> As we all know, never fuck with time. Uh, just, just a crazy idea that I just want to throw out there. 
Also, some people are saying this film is life-changing and really opened their eyes. The only lesson I gained out of this is cherish your life whether you be a boy or a girl. Be thankful for what you have. I guess for some, it can really change a person's perspective in life, but this should already be something kind of a basic for uh, living as a human being. This is the major key to living a healthy and wonderful life. Do not drown yourself with depression and anxiety. Be more optimistic and confident. Well, like I mentioned, I was not part of the field train for this movie. I had more feelings with Klein at Garden Words, 5 centimeters per second, and Anohana. Those had more meaningful stuff going on than your name. The ones I listed had made strong impacts in my own life. For instance, Clan Ned. I might make a video on this topic in the future. And with the whole stuff going on in Japan in the recent years, the film was such a huge success in Japan because it addressed to the old Japanese tales that could date back to the 12th century, the spiritual ideas, you know, Shinto, dreams, and a remnants of the huge earthquake that took place in Japan in 2011. Keep note that this natural disaster took Japan by shock and changed society. As a matter of fact, this heavily influenced Shinkai to make this movie. He used the film to reflect the sentiment that many, including himself, shared that a disaster could strike at any moment. With all the things said, even if there are good points, I feel the movie is still far from being called a masterpiece. Shinkai also said himself that he felt the movie was incomplete. In a sense, I agree with him, and I believe it could have been a lot better, but it was just a bit lacking in something. Still, it was thematic and insightful in some nice aspects. The only reason why I think people overpraise this is for its take on the real world, religion, customs, stance, and plays with our emotions. As a known fact, using feels is really effective when it comes to narrative, and Shinkai did a splendid job at it. But if you look at it with a story, plot standpoint, the story at best is mediocre. To score this out of 10 and not being biased, I would have to give this a 7 out of 10. Maybe if I was more of a spiritual person and uh, believed in mumble jumbo of destiny, fate, and appreciate the Shinto tradition and all that shit. In addition, if I had a better understanding of human emotions, love, and relationships to be exact, I would give it an 8 or a 9. But really though, our character relationship was a bit cheesy to me. And like I said in the beginning, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of an acoustic person, you know, a fucking artist. Of course, of course, I know I'll get those guys saying, Yo man, shut the fuck up! It's a good movie! Kill yourself! Yo man, this movie was fucking on fire and lit and shit, man. Hey, yo, pass me the weed! Oh my god, this movie was so beautiful! <laughs> fuck you, man, you know nothing about love! Hey man, you know that site gave it a 10 out of 10? Hey man, you know that other site gave it a 9 out of 10? I understand and read most of them, I agree with some of their points and reasoning, but some are just being a bit too narrow and just letting their emotions get the best of them. Whatever, these are just my opinions. Please take my rating as a grain of salt. If it makes you feel better, this film was not for me. I'm just fucking retarded and I probably need to kill myself. Curse me out if you want, I unironically enjoy the hate I get. Well, that's pretty much it. All I know is that Shinkai and his team are now placed on top of the pedestal. All eyes are on them now to deliver something of this caliber in the future. But in a way, it's good since it motivates them to create something with better quality. So that concludes my review. Sorry for making this too long. I was just too into this and I just couldn't stop myself. Even though I had plentiful things to say and touch upon on, to the best of my abilities, it's unfortunate that I did not find this movie that great. It was still an enjoyable film, but the story was just weak shit to me. And you know me, I watch anime for the plot. No, no, not not those plots. I, I mean, the, the main plot. You fucking perverts. Just kidding. I, I also watch anime for the, um, those anime titties, you, you know what I mean? If there was more focus on the plot, development, I guess, if there was unpredictable moments and escalation, I would have liked it better. Reminder that this is my personal opinion, please do not get offended by them. If you are offended by this, please know I'm a fucking retard, you know, I, I gotta kill myself soon. As always my lads, thank you for watching, if you liked or disliked it, do whatever you gotta do. If you want more cool shit like this, reviews, um, random shit, sub, codes out. <laughs>